gift that we are also discovering and that we are uh, coming, uh, bringing from, from the Balkans and we have our colleagues from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, and this is something that uh, uh, certainly our communities and our partners in Ukraine, we, we will have to, to go through. Uh, the war uh, brings together uh, disaster and devastation and brings together, unfortunately, a very, very, very long way of the mining process. Um, uh, we have gone with Alda for this last 30 years uh, uh, in the Balkans uh, uh, through this. And we know that it has an impact on people, uh, their safety, and it has an impact on economic development, especially for rural areas. Uh, and that is a very, very long lasting impact. And there are ways of doing that. And there are also ways of more sustainable ways to do this. So this is this part of, of environmental and people damage that mines are living on the floor. So uh, because of the long uh, commitment that ALDA is taking for, for Ukraine these days, we are very keen to know more how you are with, with our partners doing um, and embarking in this very long journey. And uh, I will not be able to stay online, but I'll, I'll definitely listen and, and, and see the video of our conversation. So I, I guess there are certainly a lot to do together on this, unfortunately. Uh, but let's try to, to, to be together and to cope in the upcoming months and years. So uh, I wish you good, uh, good, good, good meeting today. And, and, uh, and thank you, Christina and all the team for putting it together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonella. Uh, for Antonella and also all the people who would want to, uh, escape earlier. I don't advise you to do so, but if you do so, you will be able to watch a uh, recording on YouTube uh, that we will uh, upload, I think, maybe uh, tomorrow or after tomorrow. Uh, I will pass the floor now to the coordinator of our uh, Environment and Climate Hub at ALDA, Valeria Fantini, who is also uh, with us today. Valeria. Thank you very much, Christina, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here for uh, our second uh, um, appointment with our ALDA talk series on the green recovery of Ukraine. Uh, I'm Valeria Fantini, and uh, uh, as my colleague was saying, I coordinate the hub on environment and climate, um, which has worked in synergy um, uh, with this event. Uh, why? Because I want to, to uh, share with you quickly what is the hub and why uh, environment and climate is a key priority um, for ALDA as well. In fact, uh, um, as you might know, uh, ALDA, while working to reach its main core objectives uh, towards the promotion of uh, good governance and citizens' participation at the local level, um, ALDA has adopted this uh, more holistic approach uh, to its action, defining a set of themes and key priorities uh, and key priorities. And these are evident in our thematic apps. Um, environment and climate hub is one of them and environment and climate are of course a key priority for ALDA and uh, in this context uh, as my colleague was saying um, we want to tackle the we want to tackle the issue of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, also from uh, an environmental perspective uh, in fact I mean we recognize that uh, first and foremost this is a humanitarian crisis but what we want to reflect together is also on the um, environmental consequences of this and its impact on environment uh, so, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, and I will uh, pass the mic back to my colleague, Cristina. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, so, yes, today I will be moderating this, uh, this webinar. My name is Cristina Kvartsana. I'm ALDA representative in Ukraine. Uh, before we start uh, diving into the mining <laughs> discussion, I just wanted to say thank you and express our sincere gratitude to the program You Lead with Europe that is uh, supporting our event today uh, within the initiative of Bridges of Trust. We have this program, uh, this project, 
local democracy agencies in Ukraine instrument for community cohesion and development under which we are implementing this activities of Alda Talks. So this is the second episode, three more to come. Stay tuned. Uh, we will uh, tell you at the end of this meeting when is the next uh, episode uh, dedicated to eco and green innovations developed as a result of war in Ukraine by local communities. And now uh, back to, unfortunately, uh, the mining. I just wanted to uh, reflect a little bit, why do we speak about the mining today? Because, uh, especially for our non-Ukrainian participants, because as Ukraine liberates its territories, uh, mines and explosives are what the local communities are faced with next when they get their territories back. Uh, and this is basically what the Russian army leaves when they retreat from the territories. And on the territory as large as Ukraine's, the scale of the mining issue is still unknown. We just have some fragmental information that can help us make assumptions. Like, for instance, um, um, as of October 2023, the Emergency Service of Ukraine reported that around 559 civilians were injured with the, um, because of the explosions of the landmines. Uh, and 261 were uh, killed. Out of them, 65 were children, and for 14 children basically died in the territories that were already liberated. So we'd not just talk about, you know, casualties as a result of uh, artillery clashes or missile attacks. We're also speaking about casualties that we faced in the sort, sort of peaceful um, territories and peaceful time. Well, relatively peaceful, but... You see what I mean? And like this is just a little piece of information since Ukraine has managed so far to liberate only around half of the territory that has been occupied since February 24th. And this is the half that was under occupation for a relatively short time. So just a couple of months or uh, half a year in some cases. So in those territories that are that have been under occupation for a long time, like when the time comes and they get liberated, we can expect that the issue of landmines will be much uh, more serious. And this is uh, a very complex process because here not just the local communities are involved, but also, as you will see during today's episode, the international organizations, uh, the central government and many, many stakeholders. It is complex. It is life threatening. And uh, I'm, I'm great. That... Representatives of different sectors actually uh, on our panel. I will give now the floor to Daria uh, as a, as a uh, former uh, employee of the biggest land mine, uh, the mining operator uh, in Ukraine. I think she can give us a good uh, sort of uh, overview of the scale of uh, uh, land mines and explosives uh, in Ukraine and if you can, Daria, also please tell us uh, about environmental consequences of, of this issue. The floor is yours, please. Hi, Christina. Hi, colleagues. So it's a big pleasure to be here today. So thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Daria. I am a former senior program officer at Halo Trust. What this means is that all, of, all I will be uh, talking about today is going to be a uh, uh, well, my own views, and uh, this by no means should be attributed to HALO, I just ask about this explicitly. Uh, and I'm a humanitarian professional with uh, more than uh, eight years of uh, experience in the field. And uh, after the full-scale invasion, I joined the HALO Trust, which, um, as Christina mentioned, uh, is currently the biggest humanitarian mine action operators in Ukraine. Uh, it's not actually the only organization that works in the sector. Uh, there, are, there are several more. I am aware that there are also a number of colleagues and a number of other organizations that are currently undergoing the process of uh, legislation. But everyone is actually in Ukraine for the same reason, uh, to save life and limb and to uh, provide people with the safe environment that they deserve for and to alleviate the consequences of this unlawful invasion. 
Uh, and uh, also, I just wanted to say that I want to credit my um, my my colleagues from various organizations who helped me to prepare uh, to prepare to this talk because the topic of environment is well, like when we speak of a mine action, there is a lot of things that we can say. However, um, the topic of environment is a fairly new angle. It's a very it's very good that we're actually looking to it, look look into it because uh, it's one of the ways to like solve the problem in a holistic way, which is well a way to go. Uh, so today, uh, since I gather that majority of people are of no uh, mine action background, I will give a tiny bit of details uh, on uh, the humanitarian mine action operations just to uh, just to illustrate what I will be uh, uh, what I will be saying next. Uh, and then we will we will dive into wider context just to see from like the bird's view what is going on in the sector and what are the things that we will be for sure considering when speaking of envir environmental problems uh, in the future within the sector in Ukraine. And this does not only involve the humanitarian organizations, but it also involves the state, it involves uh, the local level. Um, I am very happy that today we have a representative, uh, a representative of the uh, local, um, of the local administration. Um, very happy to meet, um, and for sure there is unfortunately a lot of work. I will be showing you some slides, not too many, just a few because I don't want. I want this to be as live as possible. I don't want you to be uh, reading the text from the slides. Um, and the first thing that I will show you is uh, the contamination, well, the areas that are potentially contaminated. I am very happy that, uh, and this was already mentioned at the start of the, um, at the start of the, of the talk that we are at the moment speaking of uh, the areas that might be potentially contaminated. We unfortunately, as of right now, don't really have a very full idea of uh, what is going on. So the map that we are looking at at the moment um, are the territories that used to be um, that either used to be uh, active front lines or are at the moment still active front lines. Um, red essentially only means this part of these territories um, they they are no longer under um, under Russian control. Uh, however, this gives us an idea about where we might be looking for explosive ordnance, because uh, when you are a person, for example, outside Ukraine, and you are looking at the news saying that the, there is a massive scale of contamination, it's almost unbearable, uh, you might at times just think that the whole country is contaminated. What we need to just emphasize is that it's not necessary, it's not the case. Uh, as of right now, thankfully, uh, the uh, contamination is actually localized. Um, and once again, I prefer not to speak of the scale of contamination, but rather of the uh, areas that have been affected by explosive ordnance and where we suspect that there might be explosive ordnance. Um, as of right now, the uh, um, areas in red are the, the areas, well, the in the part of the territories that have been uh, already deal occupied. Uh, the humanitarian mine action operators have launched their programming, so there is already demining ongoing. Uh, the first humanitarian demining operators uh, started after the full-scale invasion, I think around May-June time, uh, first with a survey of the territories that have been deoccupied, and later on uh, with the actual demining operations. Uh, I also want to emphasize that uh, the uh, um, at the moment it's not just the humanitarian mine action operators uh, who deal with the uh, issue of explosive ordnance, but also the state at the same time as of right. And I'm only speaking of the situation right now. It is only humanitarian mine action operators who deal actually with humanitarian demining. The difference between humanitarian demining and military demining is basically that. Um, we, uh, when we speak of humanitarian demining, uh, this implies that there is a full clearance uh, of the uh, territories, full clearance of the mines. This is backed by the Ukrainian legislation, uh, which implies that there is, well, there is a criminal responsibility if uh, if an if an operator misses the uh, misses. The mine or anything in the uh, in the land that they are clearing. Um, 
And uh, when we speak of uh, the types of contamination that we find in Ukraine, these are um, these. It's very complex. Um, however, there is a difference between, for example, the uh, um, between the land mines um, that make up the like regular minefields. Uh, and all of the other explosive ordnance, uh, all of the other explosive ordnance items, and the difference is basically that if you have a landmine and you, if you step on a landmine, the landmine will detonate for sure. At the same time, if you, for example, have an artillery shell and you step on, a, on an artillery shell, don't get me wrong, it's still a threat. At the same time, um, it does not necessarily mean that this uh, this item of explosive ordnance will detonate. Um, so, for example, for this reason, uh, even if we at times might have the uh, uh, incidents for the explosive ordinance in the areas that are not necessarily uh, the immediate front line, uh, for example, a missile strike or a drone strike somewhere in the central Ukraine, uh, this will this will only mean it doesn't mean that there is a need in a massive scale humanitarian demining operation there. It just means that, um, well, essentially this is what the state emergency service is doing at the moment. They just come and they, if for example there is a uh, there is a missile that didn't explode, they clear this missile and this is basically it. Um, it's a different situation when we have, for example, the explos explosion at the ammunition site. Um, it's a bigger uh, a bigger problem. However, it's also not really something that, for example, um, uh, the humanitarian demining operat uh, operators uh, deal a lot in the areas that are very like either not deoccupied or the the areas that are far like further away from the front line. So this is something that mainly uh, um, I would say the, the state is dealing with at the moment. Um, our actual topic as we uh, um, as mentioned in the program is actually the link between the humanitarian between the mining and uh, and the environment. And uh, if we uh, take a simplified like a, uh, I call it a simplified look at the uh, at the issue, uh, essentially, uh, the uh, the impact of explosive ordnance on the environment it comes from several sides. So the first side essentially is the uh, mere presence of explosive ordnance in the soil, which to me personally, to all of my colleagues, uh, to uh, to all of my colleagues to whom I've spoken, uh, actually is a uh, um, it's a lesser harm. Uh, then there is there are detonations, um, and there is which is actually also an understudied um aspect as of right now however uh when we speak of um the um, detonations there is an actual reason to think that um the uh, well during detonations the uh, for example the heavy metals contained in an, a piece of explosive ordnance they get released in the environment um and i will be actually uh, uh, making an example later on just to show you um that this is something that is actually a problem and Another aspect, uh, another side uh, that the impact comes from, is um, the choice of the mine of the of the demining uh, methods. And here I will start showing you some um, some slides again. Um, so. Let me know if you can if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it well. Wonderful. So, uh, some of the uh, human some of the uh, demining techniques are actually invasive, or they might seem this way. Uh, however, the uh, humanitarian demining specialists, the uh, the people who deal with the actual operations, to whom I have uh, spoken to, uh, they say that this invasiveness, uh, well. Um, in the first place, uh, it is very frequently, or like in ninety nine percent of cases, uh, justified. Uh, and the second, that uh, essentially uh, the uh, um, it, there is some particularities, specifically in the Ukrainian case, um, on uh, what demining methods can be used. So, like sp basically, we cannot use some of the very invasive techniques um, that, for example, can be used in um, other countries here. Um, oh, and also the uh, humanitarian demining is uh, something that is aimed basically at saving life and limbs. 
um, as I always repeatedly say. So therefore, um, this is one of the primary goals. And this is essentially, at the moment, this is the biggest, uh, the biggest focus for the, uh, the mining operators. So what we see uh, on the left side, um, and this is one of the examples of the invasive technique. Uh, so these are actually trials uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, and the way it works that the, uh, um, the bucket just scoops the ground together with the uh, explosive ordnance, together with the uh, top layer of vegetation or like anything that is in there. Um, and essentially removes, uh, like it sifts the ground the mines, uh, I don't, I think that there might be a, a special grade in there that basically retains the mines, like the soil gets sifted. Um, and essentially, this is a, um, this is a way that, uh, that you remove the uh, explosive ordinance together with the, like that, well, together with the vegetation. Uh, and on the right side, uh, we have the full excavation at the site of the explosion. Um, I, I can very confidently say that apparently after the uh, explosion, there was a lot of uh, metal scrap pieces and it was not really possible to localize uh, and to differentiate between what is a scrap metal essentially and what it is a mine, because when you have uh, a signal and you know and you don't have necessarily an idea about the type of explosive ordnance that might be in there, you just need to excavate every signal. So, and in this case, we have this uh, this method that it's um, it can it might seem invasive, but it's also uh, very justified in this case um, that the top layer of the vegetation and the soil um, are removed. Um, the alternative, oh, um, also I wanted to say that in uh, for clearance of some of the types of the explosive ordinance, um, for example, the for clearance of tripwires, um, if we have a person actually doing it, it means, well, that the person is doing exactly the same as the uh, uh, demining machine and the introduction of the demining machines um, well, like not fully, like this is not fully a demining machine, but this is a, a mechanical asset aiding the demining. Um, during search of tripwires, uh, there is a need to remove the top layer, like the vegetation essentially. Um, so this is what the machine is doing. And also this is something that the uh, uh, deminer, well, basically you, you see on the right side, that's what we call careful gardening. A person need, like standing on their knees all day long and uh, very carefully trying to uh, trying to to uh, to find to see if there is um, if there is a wire in there uh, leading to explosive ordnance. Um, there is a, well given that we currently speak of um, a very huge territory that needs um, non-technical survey and uh, demining operations are also uh, currently ongoing on a very um, on a very excess, on a very big uh, territory, uh, we need the demining machines to actually aid this sort of operations. And there is um, very, um, there is very, very small room how we actually can uh, avoid using the machines as of right now, because otherwise uh, the humanitarian demining operations, um, which oftentimes already are blamed to be uh, uh, slow, uh, very slow. Um, they will become even slower. Therefore, in this specific case, uh, the use of uh, this method and this type of asset is actually justified. Um, now let's uh, make a step back uh, just to kind of like to have like a wider view of what is going on currently in the sector uh, related to the uh, environmental, uh, environmental issue. Um, as of right now, uh, Ukraine is uh, developing a, a national mine action strategy uh, that is going to become a, a guiding document um, on upon which or like underneath with uh, underneath which uh, the state policies related to uh, demining will be based. Um, I've seen a very interesting thing that was mentioned there. I've seen the it's the strategy hasn't been adopted yet. It's still in progress. Uh, I think it will be um, uh, it will be fine if the final version is going to be around summertime. But the draft version that, for example, I have seen, 
it mentions that there is a need in using like less uh, less invasive techniques. Uh, however, at the same uh, at this at this time at this stage at this time, it's uh, slightly unclear uh, as to how this um, how this wish how this wish is going to be translated into um, actual policies, how this will be translated into the national standards, because uh, all of the colleagues working in mine action know that uh, the humanitarian mine action sector, uh, well, and generally mine action sector is very regulated. There are very specific standards uh, that have been developed years and years ago, and um, they are adapted by the um, by the by this well adapted by the states, adapted by the operators. At the same time, there is um, there is not really too much room uh, how you can um, actually divert from the uh, from what it is what is considered a standard in the sector. Um, as of right now, the uh, when when we speak of the humanitarian demining sector as such in Ukraine, um, I would probably say that uh, the uh, number of operators that have started doing something related to uh, environment and um, and reconstruction uh, is uh, fairly limited. I am aware that there is um, there are a couple of agencies that are currently doing, for example, the soil tests. Uh, however, uh, and this is something that like the kind of uh, the kind of projects that are uh, ongoing in um, other countries. For example, in uh, Sri Lanka, um, our my my former organization is doing the replant mangrove forests because uh, the environment and livelihoods actually go hand in hand very often. Um, so therefore, this is one of the ways and like one of the potential areas where humanitarian demand operators uh, might be cooperating with the state. Um, and, it will, and it will be very essential that the state actually has uh, also a clear view as to ABC, this is a priority, this is what we actually want to be demand. Um, and this is actually what we want to be done. It would be a really, really essential that there is a leadership in this uh, in this aspect. Uh, at the moment, for example, there is no uh, nationwide uh, prioritization strategy. Uh, the matrix of prioritization, essentially, uh, it was told uh, by um, the National Mine Action Authority, by the Mine Action Center, that uh, the mine action operator should be focusing on. Um, agricultural fields, they should be focusing on the territories that are close to um, to people's homes. At the same time, for example, and it very well, I would say just it's justified at the moment that, for example, the demining operators are not going to be focusing on, for example, the nature reserves or on uh, big forests, because if these are no, if these are not in the immediate proximity to where the people are. Uh, this will mean that they will be just low on the list of priorities. And once again, this is something that is um, is, is very justified. Uh, the impact of um, detonations uh, is uh, something that um, is currently uh, being studied by several operators it's uh, uh, it is an area that is still requires a lot of um, a lot of additional research um however in some of the uh, in some of the countries there was um, there was a research also by the way in ukraine um between 2017 and, and 2021 uh, there was a research of uh, the um of the areas that have seen active fighting and there were soil sample tests taken, suggesting that in many, many cases, um, the uh, containment of uh, heavy metals in the uh, um, in the craters, so the, uh, the soil tests were taken from the craters, were over the, uh, um, over the normal level by uh, at least 100 times, which suggests that there will be, um, there, will, there might be, and there will be very likely a long-term impact on the health of the people living in this on, in a specific area. Uh, when speaking of the uh, link between the uh, between the mining and uh, general reconstruction, I know that as of right now, uh, there is no um, it, the 
environmental impact is not part, for example, of the compensation scheme um, uh, at the local level. So people uh, whose property is damaged, they might be able to receive some sort of compensation from the state. But for example, there is no compensation of environmental impact. Uh, however, this is something that for sure will be uh, considered during the calculating the costs of the total um, total impact of uh, uh, of uh, total destruction uh, caused by the uh, by Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, and therefore uh, helping to assess the uh, uh, to assess this impact, helping to ass to assess the scale is something. Uh, that can be also uh, one of the potential areas of uh, cooperation between the humanitarian operators uh, involved in mine action and the state. Uh, I will. Um, Sorry, I will. Thank you very much, I, 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 hope, I hope that this one is. I minute, hope that yeah. this wasn't very confusing. I will stop here. I will stop here, and I don't know if if we will be taking questions now or during the QA? Uh, we will be taking questions during the QA. I would seize the opportunity also to remind to all the participants that the QA uh, uh, section is currently empty and you have the chance to type the first question of this, of this webinar that surely will be answered. So don't miss this chance and please do uh, ask something our distinguished speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Daria. Sorry for interrupting you, but we were running a little bit short on time. I am now uh, giving the floor to Mihailina skorek Skarivska, who represents the uh, communities of Irpin and Bucha. Irpin uh, and Bucha are cities on the north of the Kyiv region that were under Russian occupation, I think 33 days, if, if I'm not mistaken. But those were probably the most cruel and tragically known uh, 33 days. The pictures of these communities, unfortunately, were um, like published on many, many uh, world magazines uh, for for the cruelty of the Russian army that was uh, stationing there. Uh, I give the floor to Mikhailina because after this tragic uh, occupation of Bucha and Rpin, uh, these communities face the issue of the mining as well, because this is what the Russian army leaves after, after them. Uh, please, Mikhailina, tell us what were uh, the experience of, of your cities. Uh, if you can uh, be brief, also in 15 minutes, it is our tops. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see that I am limited in time, but it's a big privilege to talk to you all. I am not specialist in the mining, but uh, I worked in Bucha City Council when Bucha was liberated and I'm deputy in Erpin, so... I know very well uh, about this problem from the people's level, from the local government level. Um, Dari explained very well how it looks globally. I, I'll try to add uh, some details uh, how it uh, is ongoing locally, because our territory is still, I'm speaking about Bucha district in total, not about only being Bucha, but about communities. And it's like half a million population in total, but at the same time, it's the most uh, contaminated part of cave region after Russian troops escaped from uh, our territory, from this part of Ukraine. So we, um, lots of families, uh, I, I, I should say, I think each family which was uh, going back to their homes, uh, had this problem how to check whether it's uh, clear and safe to go in, to come back, or what should we do? And we, uh, our territory was liberated uh, one year and 10 months ago, but at the same time, we still have a problem with uh, um, contaminated territories. So I'll explain how it was and how it is ongoing um, for you to understand the whole scale all over the Ukraine, because um, we don't have exact figures about our communities, because um, uh, local gov government, uh, we are um, asking uh, armed forces of Ukraine and uh, rescue teams and uh, special projects to help us 
with uh, the mining. So we are not doing it uh, ourselves, we are requesting. And um, so we have uh, statistics by Cave region, but Bucha district, it was the most uh, uh, contaminated uh, district in uh, Cave region from seven uh, districts. So we uh, the figures are most from our, our area. Um, if we look at the statistics, uh, during first months when uh, Bucha, Irpin and all the communities around were liberated, um, specialists uh, found 26,000 explosive scenes. Uh, that was different type of uh, stuff from mines from big mines uh, to very small uh, dangerous scene for example one of um, subjects i saw uh, personally that was like mobile telephone uh, when you touch it it uh, exposes or also it's very famous uh, case it was in media when uh, one family came back uh, their daughter, uh, a, a child, she was a pianist uh, uh, player, and when they opened the piano, when the specialist opened uh, the piano, they found a special dangerous scene, uh, and uh, that type of uh, um, explosive, explosive uh, materials Russians left, so they were doing it uh, in the area, in the forest, in the fields, in the places where they based, and also in the private houses, in the flats, where civilians uh, lived, uh, just to do some harm to the uh, civilian uh, people, including kids. Uh, that's why it's so dangerous. So it's, it was from, I think, from their point of view, like just for fun, but it's very dangerous and we know some uh, stories uh, when uh, our um, electricity workers, our gas workers who were restoring infrastructure, they uh, were seriously injured or some of them uh, dead because of uh, such a stuff uh, left by Russian troops. So it's very serious problem for the local um, authorities and it's a big threat even now uh, because we are doing uh, lots of reconstruction and we have a rule that each time when the team, uh, builders team is going uh, inside the building, we have to check this building again. And even now during this process, uh, sometimes we find uh, mines inside the destroyed buildings or in some parts of uh, uh, houses which uh, were not inhabited for previous time. Uh, um, as I mentioned, local government uh, is not responsible for the mining. We are uh, sending requests, uh, requests to the uh, armed forces and to the rescue forces. And Hilo Trust, it's, uh, as, as far as I know, the only licensed uh, company which is helping uh, Ukrainian authority, Ukrainian rescue teams and uh, armed forces to, to demine civilian um, um, like to uh, follow the civilian request and do all this uh, check-in before uh, reconstruction, for example. Um, so at the beginning, it was a bit, I can't say chaotic process, but in uh, spring 2022, it was very new for us. Uh, so we had lots of volunteers who knew how to do that and tried to check and then call for the rescue teams. But at the moment, it's very structured, it's very ordered, and we have special um, special rule that you, you should request it. And at the result, you have special documents uh, that uh, this um, contaminated area uh, is uh, demanded at the moment. So now it's strongly regulated. And now we could say that our territory is more or less uh, safe and checked.
but at this at the same problem at the same moment we have uh, some problems uh, with um uh, forest areas and with fields um we are not saying that they are con um, contaminated but we are saying that they are not checked uh, so we have lots of uh, territories with the status not checked yet and that means if you want to do any economy activities in that field or in that forest, you need to uh, check it first to request it for the uh, special process of uh, demining. And it's a problem, for example, during summertime uh, with even with the forest foresty fire, because even fire workers, uh, they can't go uh, to fight with the fires without this special uh, process of uh, checking of foresty areas. Um, there is a forecast uh, for our area that we need um, more, like not even more than uh, uh, 10 years to be completely checked after that 33 days of uh, Russian attack. So it's very serious and I know uh, that our specialists even now they are uh, learning in Kosovo how to do that and me personally I visited Sarajevo and we understand how serious uh, this threat could be during the years after the post war period uh, finished. Um, so um, now in our area, there are lots of information campaigning and lots of uh, NGO uh, helping teachers, uh, children, uh, local specialists to know as much as possible about the danger of uh, explosion, different type of explosion, explosive uh, uh, subjects. And even uh, in our supermarkets, we have kids games like uh, Demine, the territory where you could see um, uh, like uh, cartoons hero with explosive uh, stuff in this, uh, in on these pictures. Uh, it uh, We believe that it will help kids to be more accurate and to be more informed uh, how the explosive stuff could uh, look like. Um, so, um, may I ask you, yeah. um, uh, so do all the heads of communities know all the territories that are safe now and they're like all, all the Bucha Rayon is currently the mind and uh, not all, uh, if we, um, if we, if we, um, remember how it started, so they started from the main roads first then uh, the uh, electricity lines, then uh, the um, uh, houses and uh, um, apartment buildings, uh, then others like other area of the city, cities, uh, city area or main village uh, area, and then rural uh, area areas. And if we have like farmers, so they were requested for that, and that area is uh, demanded as well by the request. But if nobody was requested, um, for example, by default, all forests except main roads in the forest are um, announced at the moment as not checked yet. So they are uh, out to the forest. Yeah. Correct. So it's. It's forbidden to go to the forest. Of course, some locals they are uh, they went for the mushrooms because it's a tradition to collect mushrooms during during the autumn time. But officially, it's illegal because it's uh, there is a possible threat, and it's not possible to uh, demine all the territories. I could only say that uh, if we are speak about the lakes, because we are the um, uh, we are nice area area of lakes and forests. Uh, speaking about the lakes, all the lakes uh, which are situated uh, in um, Irpin, Bucha, in cities or very close, they were demined by drones, by uh, uh, underwater drones, a special by special equipment, by the request of the local government, because every mayor 
uh, know that people uh, are going to swim in the lake during the warm time. So it's a tradition. So uh, all the lakes, they were checked. But speaking about the forests and fields, uh, they are still uh, contaminated, possibly contaminated, because we, you need to check to know exactly what is there. And it's big area, so nobody... It's very expensive to do it uh, by default, so that's why it's doing the requests. Uh, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now must uh, pass the floor to the next speaker, but uh, we will come back to you in the Q&A session, if you don't mind, because I have uh, noted a couple of questions also. Very interesting to know about this from, from the local governor perspective. Uh, I'm now passing the floor to Tariq Sherak who is the, um, excuse me, uh, the head of uh, management department in the management center, yeah. Management <laughs> department there uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina Means Operation, operation Center, uh, who has more than 20 years of experience, if I'm not wrong, in the mining, and uh, uh, who will tell us more about lessons learned by Bosnia and Herzegovina, which uh, for which it's been already 25 years, but unfortunately the mining issue is still a thing there. So please, Tarek, tell us what lessons you learned, maybe what mistakes you've made that Ukraine uh, might avoid. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's glad to be in this meeting. Uh, I'm Tarek Sharak. I'm coming from the Mine Action Center of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I started with that job, let's say, a long time ago, 1997. In that time in Bosnia and Herzegovina, not existing Mine Action Center like today. It was uh, UN Mine Action Center. And uh, all what we have about mines, it's uh, practically from the war from 1992 to 1995. And we start 1996, 1997. And that part of the um, what we're doing on that time, it was um, urgent marking, urgent um, demining of, of the infrastructure, roads, uh, and uh, houses. Uh, was the very characteristic for the Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's that uh, almost whole territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina was in the war. And uh, in the first time, our first estimation was uh, uh, around 8% of the country was uh, mined. And I will try to uh, go to the slides to explain what we're doing from the long time ago, 25 years ago. Eight or 80, I'm sorry. Uh, 20, 25 years, oh, sorry. No, no, how many percent of the country's territory were? 8%, 8%, 8%. 8%. Okay. Mean, it's mean not too much, but it is. It's uh, more uh, in that first estimation, it was uh, 4,200 uh, 4, square kilometers compared with uh, with uh, our country because uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's very, very small country compared with Ukraine. It's uh, around 8%, but, but uh, uh, also when we finished the war, 1995, uh, it's same look like in Ukraine. We uh, think that whole territory uh, after the war, it's practically contaminate, but uh, okay. Uh, in the next couple of years, we tried to estimate the first general assessment to see uh, what's really uh, contaminate, what's not. And uh, characteristic in that time that in Bosnia Herzegovina, 1997, 1998 to 2000, uh, people uh, uh, tried to return to that part of the country. And uh, in the first five years, uh, the main number of casualties happened in that, let's say, five to eight years. Um, almost 80% of all uh, casualties after the war it's in, in that period. Uh, was the characteristic in that period uh, that we established here in MAC? After that, because our structure in the country, it's uh, two entities, we establish uh, federal and Republika Srpska MAC, but we uh, come back to, let's say, state level. And 2002, we established the, the first loaf of the mining and established BH MAC in form what we have now. This is also, I think, important for the Ukraine to have that regulation, something like law, something like uh, 
some type of regulation. And we established the new, uh, the first mine action strategy who was uh, for the first eight years. Uh, it's also uh, connect with um, our Ottawa Convention. Uh, we, we signed Ottawa Convention 1997-1998, and uh, we established the first strategy. The first strategy was very important for us because uh, like in same time, like today, uh, more than 50% of the uh, finance who is uh, involved in uh, the mining process is practically donation. Uh, after the war, Bosnia and Herzegovina was uh, destroyed, whole factory and everything of that, and uh, uh, practically Bosnia and Herzegovina don't have money for the whole of that, and we ask uh, United Nations or other donors to, to help Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, uh, it's very important also, I think, for Ukraine to establish some types of the mine action strategy. And uh, uh, we are also um, uh, do the 2003 first land impact survey, like first uh, general assessment. And was the characteristic for that time that that land impact survey provide uh, one non-governmental institution together with the Bosnia Herzegovina institution like independent uh, general assessment for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in that moment, we uh, conclude that Bosnia and Herzegovina have uh, 2,800 square kilometers compared with the first uh, general assessment, it's uh, almost only 60, only 60%, but it's still it's huge problem. Uh, after that, we continue to work. Uh, it was also characteristic that uh, from the 2002, we established the, the first national standard, the first national SOP for the work and also all other uh, operators in the country. Uh, we don't have a deminer in our structure, means BHMAC. BHMAC don't have a deminer. We are for the planning, for non-technical survey and for the control. Uh, the mining doing the company who is registered and accredited in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now uh, we are uh, in the in the position that um, we have uh, the third uh, strategy. It's also compared uh, um, adopted by the Ottawa Convention, and uh, we said that. We will, the new deadline for Bosnia and Herzegovina will be 2027. But in this moment, when we talk about that, I'm not sure that we will finish because still it's 800, 800 square kilometers, 800,000 uh, million square meters. It's now also uh, in, in, in suspected area in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, maybe for the next five or six years, we will finish, but okay, we will see for that. Uh, was the very important for us, and I think it's uh, also uh, important for the Ukraine because uh, that established the um, let's say uh, state structure for that in Bosnia and Herzegovina Ministry of the Civil Affairs. It's on the top and top uh, authority. We have the mining commission. The mining commission uh, established a long time ago, 1997. And this is a free members from free nationality in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they established in that moment, uh, BHMAC like central body for mine action implementation. Uh, important is that we have the law of mine action. Bosnia and Herzegovina also have strategy standard for uh, mine action, AOD operation, SOP standard operation uh, principles for the mine action and also the rules for accreditation. Uh, in the law, it's a um, regulation that only accredited companies, uh, the mining companies, could uh, work in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, that part of the legislation we comes from the 2002. Before that time, in period of the United Nations, the many of the company, international and national company, <laughs> sorry, is, comes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in that period, uh, uh, call about um, privatization, all about uh, non-technical survey, means general survey, clearance and everything of that, not be the, directly under the control of the state body, 
but after the law, after the accreditation of all of that, the regulation it goes on that way to have, uh, let's say, full control of whole process. The, I think it's very important for the, any country who is who is have uh, minor uh, problems. This is the structure. We have two sectors: sectors of operation, sectors for support. And what's the characteristic? Maybe it's a. Uh, it's uh, maybe it's uh, suitable also for Ukraine. We have two offices in two um, entities, Sarajevo and Banja Luka, and each of the part of the territory is covered by our regional offices. We have eight regional offices, and that uh, in the regional offices, it's let's say main part of the BH map. The guys who is uh, conduct non-technical survey, who is conduct the control and everything of that, who is open the task, close the task, control everything of that, practically it's in the regional office. Maybe it's also suitable for the Ukraine to establish something like that, because when I look at the, the, the maps of the Ukraine and the liberate and non-liberate territory also uh, look like in, in, in Bosnia that you, you need... Uh, offices, maybe offices in that specific region. Of course, uh, they are connect with the uh, entities, entities part and central uh, central body in BHMAC. We have central database and uh, uh, let's say all the tasks coming from the, from the top of the, of the structure. Uh, what's the, the main job of our uh, center, my nation center, means we are established and maintains the database. Uh, now we try to, uh, our database convert to INSMA core. I th think you have heard about that. It's a, uh, un let's say, unique INSMA uh, database who provide the my nation cent uh, my, uh, center from Geneva. We try to, to establish that because we are not start with IMSMA in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we start with our owner database, but for uh, Ukraine, it's not necessary to start with the owner database. They, you, can, you can use uh, IMSMA core because IMSMA core in last 20 years is now it's better, better and better. And the, I think uh, uh, this is a privilege of the Ukraine to use the something uh, what, what's the build last 20 years. We conduct uh, uh, non-technical survey and urgent marking. It's also a task for the RAO regional office. My risk education and my victim assistant, especially my risk education or AORE, uh, it's um, main task also for our regional office. And uh, in this phase in, in, in uh, Ukraine, I think it's very important job to uh, establish that, that part of the mine action, my risk education. Also, central office is planning uh, preparation of the project, technical documentation, prioritization. Uh, it's very important because uh, in, let's say, in first couple of years, it was urgent, uh, urgent marking and urgent demining process without prioritization in that, that real, let's, let's say real part, because uh, uh, many of the structures, infrastructures and everything was destroyed. And uh, okay, it's it's necessary to uh, when when you uh, uh, in period after the war to reconstruct the building, to reconstruct the railways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we prepare also mine action plan and reports, and um, Council of the Ministry adopt that every years. Definition that's technical and safety standards accreditation and uh, what's the very important uh, and what we do in the in the beginning in Bosnia and Herzegovina we are training the people we have uh, built the capacities and uh, UNMAC work very very hardly to build capacity in Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in, in that moment after three years uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina was accredited more than 3,000 deminers uh, okay it's it's um, also a reason why we have that, let's say for the Bosnia and Herzegovina, a huge number of the deminers. Also it's uh, that um, fact that those guys comes from the war. It comes from the army teams and everything of that. We start with the humanitarian demining after 1998 because um, mine lifting, how we call that uh, military demining, 
show that uh, it's not suitable for Bosnia and Herzegovina because uh, we don't have whole uh, minefield records. We don't have whole uh, knowledge about uh, which of the part of the country, specific it's uh, mine or not mine. We don't have uh, interview of the guys uh, who, who will say if, if you don't have my records, I think you will have the same problem because I'm not sure that Russian will give you the whole record records, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is a very hard, very hard job to, to, to try to find any information uh, in, in the first moment. And uh, we are trying for that. OK, Dayton agreement in Bosnia and Herzegovina ordered to each who, who was in, in, in war to, mu to must uh, give whole information about uh, minefields, minefield records. But when we now calculate, it's um, we uh, collect only maybe 60, 65 percent, no more than that, and all others, it's um, let's say unknown. And uh, uh, humanitarian demining, it's uh, only only way to find that mines for do you do you don't have uh, the records practically. Uh, quality assurance, quality control, it's also part of our job, our job in BHMAC. And also research, development, advocacy. It's something what, what uh, we are doing in this, uh, let's say, 20, 25 years. Uh, very characteristic, and maybe it's also suitable for the Ukraine, uh, for the huge area when you don't know exactly where is the, the, the minefields, and urgent marking don't help very well. Maybe uh, sometimes. What you uh, see here, some types of the billboard with the mine situation, and maybe it's a suitable for the guys who is coming in that area to uh, to see uh, uh, roughly where is the mine In Bosnia, it's okay. After 20, 25 years, we not exactly, we don't know exactly where is the mine, but this is a, a not a huge area now in, in this moment. But in, in the beginning, Maybe billboard or something like that for my risk, risk education and for the, the, the people who is, want to come return, it's very, very suitable to know. But uh, for this, this uh, you must have some types of the database. Uh, you must have some topography, you must have some mapping to try to show guys who is coming in that area, where is that dangerous area? And this is also uh, very, very important to establish some types of the database, IMSMACOR or similar, but IMSMACOR is uh, good enough for uh, in this moment for the mine edge. This is uh, some types of the mine risk education who we provide that from the beginning and this moment also, because we uh, still we have 8,000 8, square kilometers of suspected area, vulnerable uh, local communities. Uh, Sorry, we try minute, please. Sorry, okay. We try to go, to, let's say, to door to door and provide the information about mine situation in, in that because we, you you can see here that you have a reconstruction in in, in this area. Uh, was also very very important, and we think in, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's a school education, and we try to put that in school programs. Uh, it's it's not easy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have 13 ministry of the <laughs> school because it's uh, two entities, cantons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's very, very, very good to have that maybe two or three uh, uh, lessons per years to, to teach the children how to how to um, uh, how to look at all of that. Don't touch anything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is a, for us; it's very important. And this is this is a short presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like maybe to just ask you, since Daria uh, mentioned that currently Ukraine is in the process of developing this national strategy on the on mine action or the mining, and you've done how many not one like more than one of them right you've done one strategy and then you had the monitoring uh, later on and then there was another strategy maybe something on the process of developing this strategy like were you involved in 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 drafting like were i don't know 
uh, local communities involved in drafting this sort of document? Was it just the national government document? What was the process? If you can give us like a few hints. Tarik? Yes. Sorry, I don't hear. Uh, about the strategy, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the third uh, strategy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The last one, what we have now, we are connected with the uh, very strong with the um, United Nations 17 goals, environment and everything of that. Uh, and um, okay, uh, we're planning now, let's say, uh, I think in next year that we will establish the new one, the new one, because uh, uh, deadline is 2027, and we are not calculated that we will finish maybe for the next five years or something like that. But uh, uh, let's say that that strategy will be, uh, let's say, very precise because we are in past year, past 20 years, we have collected enough information. Now it's uh, our program for next, let's say, five years, will we go uh, like program who, who, who will go to the finish. Uh, I, I don't, I, Miss, uh, to, to um, tell you that uh, who is working in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have a governmental organization, means army forces and civil protection, and uh, also NGOs and commercial company. Uh, we calculate that uh, in, in next five years, all of that company will exist in Bosnia. But after that, we, we calculate that uh, only civil protection, mine action, like my action center and uh, army forces will stay in the, maybe a couple of no no governmental organization, but our program going down yeah, and then we, we we try to 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 finish everything of that yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two questions in the Q and A chat, both addressed to Daria. I get yes, and uh, one is sort of partly answering the the first one because. Uh, <laughs> The first question was about the priorities of land plots. So like, how do you prioritize which land plot to the mine first? And the second question uh, sort of stated that the agricultural land is the priority. So I will let you confirm or deny that. And then the question goes as follows. Uh, if uh, the organization like yours, so I imagine they implied uh, like big um, organizations like H Halo, if they do any uh, lab, or, uh, lab tests uh, to test the uh, soil uh, to see how much it is contaminated since it's an agricultural land or just like the soil gets to be uh, cultivated without any checks and control. Would you please, uh, yeah, Daria. Uh, yes. Yeah, so to uh, to the first question, uh, uh, just to just to repeat once again, there is currently no prioritization at the state level. It's really great. I mean, I'm all in for this uh, prioritization to be developed. Currently, the process uh, is the following: um, we are well. We also have the uh, uh, mine action center in Ukraine. Uh, and they somehow, to a certain extent, are involved in prioritization. So, for example, they might uh, tell a certain operator to, um, for example, go and demine a specific area in a specific district, uh, which the humanitarian operator does. Uh, at the same time, uh, when we speak of the uh, um, of the tasks uh, of the uh, uh, of the areas where the demining operations are uh, are carried out that are uh, not, that haven't been pointed at basically. Uh, here we have uh, we have a like an internal prioritization uh, that is based on uh, the number of people on the proximity, for example, to the residential areas, uh, on the type of, uh, on the type of a, of a task, uh, which is basically goes to whether this is a battle area clearance or this is a, a minefield clearance. Um, uh, However, it would be actually really great if uh, at some point there is a uh, there is a unified uh, prioritization because in this case everybody is sure that everyone is uh, working towards the same thing. Um, and on the second question, moving on to this one, um, thank you very much. It's a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting, very good question. Uh, what uh, I can say is that, that uh, the, given the where we are currently as humanitarian mine action sector in the programmatic cycle, I know that uh, several organizations, um, Halo Trust including, have started doing the soil sample tests. Uh, 
Uh, I am not, I don't really think it will be appropriate for me uh, to speak on behalf of Halo as to uh, when and whether these will be, uh, this will be shared, this will be published. But I just wanted probably to return to the thing that I mentioned during my session that uh, this is still a very understudied field first. And the second is basically, uh, is, uh, we, as of right now, like we don't work in the areas. Um, and I mean, this is just generally like the humanitarian mine action operators don't work close to the front line period. Uh, this is very justified for this for safety security reasons. Uh, for example, our ta uh, our um, our minefields, they don't look like uh, what I showed you in the presentation was a very exaggerated picture. Our none of our um, none of our minefields actually look uh, like the uh, uh, the road to chassis VR um, that was on the presentation. Um, therefore, it's actually I mean, like, well, I assume that at some point if uh, we move towards somewhere where we actually have the the minefields that look like this, uh, we will be uh, will be doing more in this regard. At the same um, at the same time, given that, I mean, what we can tell to people uh, where we, uh, for example, just have like a couple of craters on the task, um, if there is at some point, for example, a national standard, um, if there is a national requirement to do soil tests, I'm uh, more than sure that well, everyone will be um, more than happy to do it. It's just, well, essentially, as of right now, it's not a part of uh, quality management, quality assurance process, um, but something might change in the future. I hope that I answered the question. Thank you very much, Dalia. And we had another question from Valeria, our coordinator of the Climate and Environment Hub. Please, Valeria. Uh, thank you, Christina. And first of all, thank you all for your, this very interesting session. Um, I also have a question for you, Daria. Um, and this is related, uh, uh, let's say, on environmental aspects uh, of uh, the mining. And I wanted to ask you uh, if... Uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, environmental standards that the mining operators have to comply with, um, and you know both uh, at the local, national, or international level. So, if these type of standards are foreseen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Valeria. Uh, there is an international uh, international standard on uh, on the applies to humanitarian uh, humanitarian mine action oper uh, operations uh an IMAS standard uh at the same time um it uh, and the humanitarian mine action operators and uh, all of the mine action operators they take the standards they apply the standards um however they also like they work within the national leg legislative framework and we have the national standards uh that are um, that are well based on the uh, on the international standards as of uh, what basically as of uh, what I know as of what I've seen uh, these are uh, these do not necessarily look that attentively uh, at the uh, topic of environment um, as of right now however uh, given what I've seen in the draft of the national strategy given what uh, they say about the use of uh, less invasive techniques um, I assume that there might be a there might be a change to the national standards. We really cannot tell as of right now. There is just too much going on. Um, at the same time, I just also want to um, want to say that in uh, well, majority of the operators, um, they, it, it's it's a need to find an optimum balance, especially given the uh, the well the the sheer uh, the sheer amount of territories that we have that we have contaminated to find an optimum balance between for example the speed of the demining operator uh, operations and saving the environment i assume in some cases like the mining in, of nature reserves uh, there might be uh, some direct agreements between the uh, nature reserves and the humanitarian mine action operators but like later later on not now uh, as to what the mining methods might might or might not be used in certain cases um, however, for example, if you search for tripwires, you need to remove the vegetation. This is just well, like it's just how it stands. I hope, uh, I hope I answered. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Daria. Uh, the question that I had, uh, I'm not sure whether I should address it to you or to Michalina or to Tarek or to all of you all together, because uh, for me. 
uh, from like after listening to the three of your presentations, I had a confused impression on the fact of responsibility because Michalina said, I think that it's not the responsibility of local communities, uh, like to, the mining is not their responsibility. Um, but at the same time, I feel like the local communities are responsible for the safety of their citizens. So the, the clear and safe right territory is the responsibility of local communities. Then we engage national service in some parts of Ukraine, like the SNS, like uh, emergency service. And there are these big uh, the mining operators, like companies, they are like, I imagine private contractors or, or something, right? So uh, who, who is responsible in case of uh, the job? I mean, sorry if this is like a very primitive question, but we are not from the mining field. So who is who, who bears the ultimate responsibility? responsibility if 100% clean, clean like if there was for instance involved uh, the mining operator that was hired by the local community like in the hypothetical situation and there was still some mine like left in and someone died from it I don't know who, who wants to address it sorry for if it's uh does it make sense like is it a clear question yeah Maybe. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. A, it's a very clear it's a very clear question. I would uh, I uh, I would probably uh, I don't know, Michalina, if you want to actually take it and tell uh, uh, about the local perspective, and then I might perhaps just add uh, about like the wider context, if you don't mind. Michalina, are you still with us? Maybe you start then, and Michalina will continue when she she gets back to us. Uh, okay, so um, as of right now, we have uh, multiple operator. Oh, okay. Michaelina, did you hear the question? Excuse me, do you hear me well? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, you mean, uh, I, I missed uh, 30 yeah. seconds. The question was, uh, in, in the situation, if like the local community hires the a uh, private contractor to the mine to clear the territory from the mines but the job is not done like 100 percent well so someone dies from from this mine who bears the ultimate responsibility I could, I could explain look it's uh for the civilians it's the reason of safety so they are not checking the if you don't need a dog if you need a um, official paper that's uh um, this territory is uh, demined and it's very requested if you work with international reconstruction teams or with international partners, it's not possible to do any job anywhere, even if the school which is operating every day uh, without this official document. So even for the schools which are operating every day, you need to uh, invite sort of, uh, um, Companies uh, or Halo Trust or Armed Forces or Rescue uh, and the mining team and no other options to get this document. So it's the only option. If you need it for yourself, for your own safety, that's the reason of trust. So if you trust the team, if you uh, this team is recommended and it's private team, it's okay. They are checking first, but they are not, don't have a permission to give you a, an official certificate. And that's the difference. Um, lots of my uh, colleagues and friends, they use these uh, private teams, but if you need to confirm it officially, you need to uh, request for the company uh, and to get the certificate. Um, and I, I'd like to add that these um, private teams and also our official teams, they use dogs to check the territory because we were not mentioning dogs, but in our area, it's very popular. For example, if we have a threat or call that school might be um, contaminated, usually it's the team with the dog and they are very uh, well trained in our area and very popular to invite uh, such service. Daria, do you want to add on that? 
Uh, yes, just maybe on the uh, uh, on the um, uh, on the point about whose responsibility it is to when, for example, when an accident happens on a uh, on a cleared land. So Mikhailina uh, explained that there is a like once well, basically once you have the uh, the 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 mining operations finish, uh, there is a uh, what what is called uh, a, a process of handover of cleared land, uh, and therefore we have the the mine action operator. Um, the uh, National Mine Action Center uh, knows, and the uh, uh, National Mine Action Authority, they know where that the humanitarian operator uh, worked in this location. Uh, this uh, this location stays with them for like as long as they are there. Or I mean, sometimes it happens actually that the um, mine action operator moves out from the territory. This hasn't happened so far, but this was the case, for example, before in uh, in uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk region, when there was like a handover from like one operator to another of the task that wasn't, for example, like hasn't been finished. And then basically the responsibility has been, the responsibility is being taken over by this operator. Um, and um, once essentially the clearance procedure uh, is over, there is a there is a handover. The local council accepts um, the cleared land. However, um, this hasn't happened so far. But this, well, I assume, unfortunately, this might be the case in the future. Uh, if there is uh, and there is a QA uh, uh, and uh, there is a QA pr procedure and like quality management uh, check on uh, on the on the task by the mine action center um, before the official handover procedure can take place. Uh, however, I assume that in this and just from the legislation that there will be a responsibility of the operator in case there is something that happens um, and it's clearly attributable to a mistake of an operator in the future because there might be also situations when um, there is a um, there is a mine or like there is a uh, there is a there, there is there is a for example a tripwire that is installed in the uh, specific location after clearance i mean i this is at, at this stage uh there is just so much going on that this almost sounds like a fantastic scenario but it just kind of like might happen in the future to be honest uh if this is clearly attributable to the operator the operator will be held responsible if there is a it but it's a bit unclear uh if if there is no such connection Thank you very much, Daria. Uh, I do want Tarik if you want to add on this. Our device will be wrapping up and closing the the session. Okay, okay, uh, Christina, it's it's very good question. In in last 20, 25 years, it's happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina that in the cleared area, technical survey cleared area, we uh, many times find uh, not uh, not explosion, but find the, the, the let's say part of the mines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, our rules, it's very clear uh, against that, that company must go against and clear part of that. In one case, we have the court case, uh, because um, uh, workers in the railway uh, injured, sorry, injured in technical area, and the final of that uh, was uh, like final uh, Company and state means BHMAC and everybody who is around the BHMAC, it was guilty for that. Nobody goes to the prison, but uh, uh, it's well, it was um, let's say uh, some some type of, of the, the punished of the, the the companies like negative points etc cetera, etc. Cetera, and also BHMAC, but uh, definitely finally in our um, regulation uh, state it's. Uh, finally response for everything of that. We are uh, organize everything of that, we are surveyed, we are uh, uh, doing the quality assurance, quality control, uh, working with the local community, uh, hand over the, that, um, let's say, uh, that area to local community and definitely state it's uh, first who is response for everything of that. And uh, this is it. This is a, in our case, and also I think in international standard, the local author, local authority means state authorities must take the, the responsibility for everything like that. Thank you, Tarek. Um, and I say we should uh, uh, 
unfortunately close this very captivating discussion. Uh, I thank all the speakers. I remind you, we had today Daria Zhitkova, humanitarian expert with us, Mikhailina skorek Skarivska, a local counselor from Irpin and the founder of Institute for Sustainable Development of Communities, and Tarik Sharak from the uh, Landmines uh, Action Le Landmine Mine Action, Mine Action Center of Bosnia and Herzegovina. That was a great discussion. Uh, thank you also my colleagues, Valeria and Veronica for organizing this event and Olena, the translator. Uh, I want to remind you that this is just the second of our ALDA talks. There are three more. Next one will be about eco innovations and green innovations uh, in Ukraine developed in the cities during the war. Uh, I just posted on chat the link to the registration. It's going to happen on the 22nd of February, oh, 26th, I'm sorry, of February, the same time, 3 p.m. set, uh, 4 p.m. Kiev time. Uh, I, I think we had a great exchange today. All the questions were answered. Uh, if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact us at uh, Alda's mailbox and have all the great evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye.